I want to point you to three things about the resurrection. Okay, I want to kind of give you an outline of where we're going so you can know the plan for today and you cannot be confused. First thing we're going to look at is how we know Jesus' resurrection happened. Two, why we hope in a future resurrection. That is us as Christians, why, why, we, know, why we claim to know what happens when we die. Why we hope that someday we will be resurrected with Jesus. And number three, what Jesus' resurrection promises those who trust Him. How we know, why we hope, and what Jesus' resurrection promises. Number one, how we know Jesus' resurrection happened. We know biblically, circumstantially, and historically. So, let's go through some biblical evidence of Jesus' resurrection. If you were with us on Easter Sunday last year, we went through some of this stuff just talking about the fact that Jesus did arise from the dead. But I want, I want you guys to see this as truth, and I want you to be convinced of this, not because I'm saying it, but even logically, you can look at the evidence and say, it happened. So, biblical evidence. Jesus' resurrection was prophesied 700 years in advance. If you go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, it's about Jesus. And if, if you just read it, if you, if you wrote all of this down, Isaiah 53, if you wrote it down just on a piece of paper, typed it out, and took it to pretty much anyone that lives in the Bible Belt, and he said, who is this talking about? Most of them, unless they were really familiar with their Bible, most of them would just say, it's about Jesus, and it's probably from the New Testament. It's talking about Jesus dying on a cross for people's sin. It's talking about the fact that Jesus will not be abandoned to hell, but Jesus will arise from death to life. He will see light and be satisfied even though he died. He will come back to life. Most people would probably tell you, yeah, that's, probably, that's a New Testament. It's talking about Jesus. But actually, it was in the book of Isaiah that was written 700 years before Jesus even came to the earth. If you've ever read Isaiah 53, you know that probably when you're reading it, you're, you're thinking almost like you're reading it like it had already happened. It says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was given up for our sins. He was crucified in our place. And you read it, and I forget. Well, I'm reading something that was written 700 years before Jesus even came. And a few hundred years before anyone had even presented this idea of a resurrection even happening. So Jesus' resurrection is promised 700 years in advance in the book of Isaiah. Number two, Jesus predicted his own resurrection. If you look through the gospel accounts, just in the gospel of Mark, Jesus predicted his own resurrection three separate times. He tells his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, and three days later I will rise. They didn't get it, they didn't get what he was saying. Jesus taught them in a lot of parables from time to time, and so probably they heard him say that, and they're thinking, I have no idea what that parable is about. <laughs> but Jesus wasn't speaking in some parable or a story or a metaphor. He's saying, no, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to get out of the grave. I'm telling you this so that when it happens, you will know all the more that I am God, that I did what I said that I'm doing on the cross, that I did what I said I'm doing in my life. Jesus even prophesied it. It's not as if people came around and said, no, 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 Jesus rose from the dead and it just happened. It's like, gee, the, the Bible said it was going to happen 700 years before. Historically documented in the book of Isaiah. Then Jesus in his life was walking around saying, hey, I'm, you're going to destroy me. You can destroy this temple, but in three days later I will build it up again. And people thought he was talking about the actual physical temple, but he's talking about himself and said, you, you can kill me, but I'm going to offer myself up. You're going to kill me, and I'm, I'm going to get out of the grave. Number three, Jesus died. A lot of people try to explain away the resurrection by saying that Jesus didn't really die. Uh, the Muslim faith says that Jesus swooned on the cross. They say that Jesus just passed out on the cross and then they took him down, and yeah, they took him to a tomb, because you can't deny any of this. They took him to the tomb, they wrapped him in some clothes, and then he just kind of slept for three days. And then he got out of the grave three days later, and he starts walking around to people. This is not true. Uh, how many of you guys, when you stub your toe, or, or if you were to break your toe, for the next three or four weeks, probably you can't even walk without looking like you've got a problem. You're walking around looking like you can't even use your whole leg. Jesus, the... the 
accounts tell us Jesus was scourged. Jesus had a cat of nine tails, leather straps of bone and metal latched into his flesh 39 times, ripping his flesh apart. Many men, when they were going through this scourging, this beating, wouldn't, he, wouldn't even live past it. Jesus lived beyond that, and he carries his cross, and then he's crucified. His nails are driven through his hands and his feet. He's hung up, suffocating on a cross for six hours. And then finally, the executioner comes up to make sure that he's dead, takes a spear, drives it up through his rib cage, and what doctors tell us today, actually what they were doing was, they would make sure they're dead by driving a spear through their heart of the person on the cross. So it says that the spear was driven through his side, right up here, piercing his heart, and blood and water just gush out. Just so you know, the whole point of crucifixion was to kill people. People try to say, Jesus was crucified, but he didn't really die. That's the whole point. They drove a stake through his heart to make sure that he was dead. <clears throat> it's like saying, oh yeah, he went to the electric chair, but it was just a fake. That's the whole point. That's why they invented the electric chair, so people would die. They invented crucifixion so that they would kill people in the most painful way possible. Jesus actually died. Jesus was buried in a tomb that was easy to find. Joseph of Arimathea, who was a part of the Pharisees, part of the Sanhedrin, part of the Jewish leaders, who were the, actually the ones that conspired against Jesus to have him crucified. This guy Joseph that we see that came and took Jesus' body and buried it in his own tomb. This was a rich guy, and it was documented in these days, just like today. If I own a house, people, there's documentation all over that knows where my house is, and that I own my house. Just like in those days, this guy Joseph owned the tomb, and so the city knows where this guy's tomb is, and he's a rich guy buried among rich people's tombs, and so Joseph's tomb was easy to find. The guards are even there keeping watch over it, but Jesus' body was never found because he got out of that grave. It wasn't like he was buried in some crazy spot and everyone was like, well, they said they buried him, but we have no idea. We can't find it. They found where his tomb was. People went to Joseph's tomb and they didn't find Jesus because he wasn't there. Number five, Jesus appeared physically, not just spiritually, alive three days later. Some people try to say that Jesus' resurrection wasn't actually a bodily resurrection. He didn't actually arise from death to life. It was just spiritually or in our hearts he arose. Or when he was walking around, he was just some kind of phantom. But Jesus even says to this, they, his disciples, when he comes to them, they're hanging out in a room in Galilee. They don't believe it happened because the first eyewitnesses are women. And the women tell them, the, the Lord is alive. And they say, you guys are being hysterical. So Jesus walks into a room. It says that he essentially walks through the wall and just comes and is in hanging out with his disciples. And they freak out, screaming. They didn't believe it. They were scared. They had the doors locked because they think the Jews are going to come kill them too because they were followers of Jesus. But Jesus comes and they say, it must be a ghost. And he says, does a ghost have flesh and blood like I have? He says, I'm not a ghost. Jesus says, touch me. Put your hands in the, the holes of my hands. Put your hands in my side and see where the spear drove through. Jesus appeared bodily. People ate with him. The reason people didn't go to Jesus' tomb is because you could go have dinner with him. Jesus didn't go to, people didn't go to Jesus' tomb and enshrine it or anything like that because people were eating breakfast with him. Jesus is cooking fish on a fire, hanging out with people for 40 days. 500 plus people see him at one time. This is why the scripture is still, it hasn't been refuted for 2,000 years because it's eyewitness accounts of this happening. You have 500 people that view something, you can't refute it. You come into the court of law in America and someone says, this happened, and everyone goes, that's crazy. You have any eyewitnesses? Well, we have 500. Oh, okay. Well, that holds up pretty good in the court of law. 500 plus people saw Jesus at one time. <clears throat> Number six, Jesus' resurrected body looked the same as his pre-resurrected body. Here's what I mean by this. Some people say that Jesus actually had some kind of twin or some kind of brother that they substituted him for him before Jesus was crucified, and this guy was actually crucified, and Jesus wasn't. Jesus hid out for a few days, and then Jesus comes forth and says, what's up? 
or the other way around, that Jesus was actually crucified, and they were like, we got to figure out, we got to get a main tree. Well, I don't know what, we got to get somebody that looks like Jesus to come and act like he's alive. No, but it was Jesus. His disciples didn't go, who are you? They knew, you're Jesus. They did not recognize him, and then Jesus said, no, 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 I know it doesn't look like me, but it, it's me, it's Jesus, I'm alive. They knew that it was him, because it looked exactly like he had looked before his resurrection. Number seven, Jesus' resurrection was recorded as scripture shortly after it occurred. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's probably the best set of scriptures in the whole Bible just talking about the resurrection and that it's fact and that they're eyewitnesses and that the disciples saw it. 500 people saw it. But this book was written not even 20 years after Jesus' resurrection. This letter was written to this church just shortly after. Some people will try to say that uh, the New Testament wasn't written until like 200 A.D. or 150 A.D. But if you talk to any scholar that has any credibility, they'll say, no, it, these these letters were written within one lifetime of when it happened. The latest gospel account that was written, the last one of the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John was written in about AD 95, because John lived to be about 100 years old. So it's written within one lifetime of when Jesus actually lived, died, and arose. These are eyewitness accounts, and it was recorded as scripture just right after it. 1 Thessalonians is dated as written anywhere from about 40 to 52 A.D. This is anywhere between 7 years and about 19 years after Jesus. And it talks about the resurrection of Jesus. It was, a meet, it was documented just pretty quickly. People started writing about it. People started preaching about it. Number 8. Jesus' resurrection convinced his family to worship him as God. Anybody ever heard of the Apostle James that wrote the book of the Bible, James? This was Jesus' brother. And he didn't follow Jesus. He didn't worship Jesus while Jesus was alive. He thought Jesus was crazy. Probably as you guys would if your brother rises up and says, I'm God, and starts going off and starts a ministry, you go, you're crazy, I grew up with you. There's, what? James didn't worship Jesus as God until the resurrection. James saw that Jesus died brutally on a cross, and three days later, he arose from death to life, and James goes, you're God. James went on, history tells us, to die in Jerusalem. He was one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, and because he wouldn't deny Christ, because he wouldn't deny that Jesus is God and the Savior and Christ of the world, they threw him off the temple and told him, recant. He says, no, my brother. The guy that was my brother, he's, a, he's God. They threw him off the temple. His legs burst open. He lived through the fall. They came down there and talked to him again and said, one more chance, recant. He said, no way. He starts praying to Jesus to forgive these people. They take a club and they beat him in the head until he dies. Jesus' brother worshipped him as God. I don't know if you guys have brothers and sisters. How, what would you have to do to convince them that you are actually God without them being just out of their mind? Jesus' mom worshipped him as God. Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, ended up worshipping him as God. We see in the book of Acts that there are about 120 people after Jesus' ministry, his life, death, resurrection. There are only about 120 people that were actually still his disciples, his followers, that didn't abandon him and say, this guy's crazy, we don't know what's going on. 120 of them. Mary's one of them. She's in the upper room waiting with the apostles after Jesus' resurrection because, because he got out of the grave. If anyone knows you and knows your secrets and knows that you're really at your core evil, it's your mom, right? I think that probably the hardest person in the world for me to convince that I was Lord, Savior, God, and Christ would be my mom. She knows me as your moms know you too. But Jesus' resurrection convinced his family to worship him. Number nine, Jesus' resurrection was confirmed by his most bitter enemies. Anybody ever heard of the Apostle Paul? His name used to be Saul, and he was actually opposed to the church. He was actually, in that day, what we have is like bin Laden. He's killing 
Christians. He's a terrorist. His whole job was, we got to find all the Christians. we got to kill them. we got to get rid of them because they're leading people away from the Jewish faith. And then Saul is going to this other city, and Jesus appears to him after his resurrection. He says, Saul, why, why are you persecuting me? He was an enemy of Jesus, and as you well know, Paul went on to write roughly a half of the New Testament. But at one time, his whole passion, his whole drive, his whole purpose was killing people that confessed Jesus as the Christ. Why would, why would an enemy just all of a sudden say, I, I was wrong. I'm going to actually serve you now rather than trying to kill all of your followers. Because Jesus got out of the grave. Now we see all of this kind of stuff through the Bible, right? This probably maybe will become a little bit convincing to you as we move on, but some will still say, and maybe you're still thinking this too. Well, yeah, that's the Bible, though. That's what the Bible says. You believe the Bible? I don't really believe the Bible. I don't think it's as accurate as you think it is. Okay, let's move into some circumstantial evidence. Some circumstantial evidence of the resurrection. Jesus' disciples were transformed. You guys remember Peter? Peter is saying in the upper room, he's saying to Jesus, I will die for you. And all of these other guys, all your other apostles, we, we all know I'm the best. If all these other guys walk away from you, I will not, and I will go, and I will die for you, with you. And Jesus just says, you're going to deny that you even know me tonight. And then later we see that Peter is following along, watching Jesus after he's been arrested, and he's about to be beaten and some people, a little, like, 13, 14-year-old girl says to Peter, Hey, you're one of Jesus' disciples. No, I'm not. <clears throat> Jesus, or Peter starts peeing his pants because a 14-year-old girl is trying to accuse him. But he denies three times that he even knows Jesus when hours before he had said, It, it doesn't matter what it is, I'm going to die for you. You are God. You're the Lord. You're Savior. And then Peter goes on. And after the resurrection, after seeing the risen Jesus and being sent out by Jesus, Peter goes on to be the leader of the early church to plant many churches and to endure many persecutions. And eventually, history tells us that Peter was crucified on a cross upside down. Peter is about to be crucified for his faith in Jesus, for proclaiming the good news of the gospel and he says, do not crucify me right side up. I am not worthy to die like Jesus died. Do it upside down. So they honored his request. They turned the cross upside down. And Peter was nailed to that wood. How would a guy come from denying even knowing Jesus and then being willing to spend his whole life in sacrifice for him to spread the gospel and then to eventually be crucified? And he's not trying to talk them out of crucifixion. The only thing he's worried about is, I don't want to die in the same way Jesus did. I'm not worthy. Jesus' disciples were completely transformed. If you read through the gospel accounts, you'll see they're constantly failing. They're constantly saying things that you go, what the heck are you talking about? You guys so dumb? You don't get this? They weren't loyal really to Jesus, especially after his death. They thought it was over. They were following Jesus and he, he died and they think, well, we had a good run. But they were transformed after this because Jesus got out of the grave. Jesus' disciples remained loyal to him through severe persecution and even to death. He had 12 disciples, apostles, that he had sent out. 11 out of the 12 died brutal, sacrificial deaths. All of them were martyred except John, who lived to be about 100, who Jesus kept alive because John finally wrote the book of Revelation. John was boiled in oil. They tried to kill him by putting him in a huge vat of boiling oil, and he didn't die. He just became disfigured and got scars all over his body, and his flesh was burnt away, but he, he didn't die. But all of the rest of them were either crucified, they were either burned at the stake, their heads were chopped off. How, how all of a sudden do you just remain loyal? Because they had seen the risen Jesus. People aren't going to live and die for something that they think eh, could be true. No, as soon as it gets really hard, if you're not really convinced of something, you're going to turn away. As soon as persecution comes, as soon as they're threatening to kill you, or with us, as soon as they're threatening to, oh, I don't know if you can get this job. A lot of us in our culture go, oh, 
These guys are being killed, but they remained loyal to him because they saw him rise from the dead. Number three, the day of corporate worship changed. God's people for thousands of years had got together every Saturday to worship God, to read from the Bible, all this stuff, right? How all of a sudden would that just change to Sunday? You guys notice we're here on Sunday? That's when the church gets together now? It wasn't because people just figured out, yeah, I'm kind of sick of Saturday. We need to change. How many of you guys, if you've grown up in church, you know the last thing a lot of churches want to do is change. If I told you guys, well, we're going to start getting together on Tuesday at about 3 p.m. instead of Sunday mornings. I'd be like, well, you're, we won't be here. You're crazy. <laughs> You guys don't, we don't want to change that kind of stuff. So how all of a sudden, after thousands of years of worshiping on Saturday, would it just all of a sudden go to Sunday? It's because Jesus got out of the grave on Sunday morning. So the church said, in light of this, we're going to gather on Sundays. Because Jesus got out of the grave. Number four, women discovered the empty tomb. In this day, in this first century time, in this Jewish culture... Women were kind of second-class citizens, and they weren't even allowed to testify in a court. So what, if you were fabricating the story of Jesus' resurrection, if you, if you, a lot of people say Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they just kind of conspired, and they said, let's make up this story that Jesus lived, died, and arose, and really got out of the grave. If you were doing that, there is no way that you would write in there that women were the first ones to discover the tomb. The only logical explanation for the fact that the women are the first ones at the tomb is that it actually happened. If you're trying to prove to people that something happened that didn't really happen, you would say that these men, you would even try to write in there that like these high men in this society came and they discovered it. And everyone would go, well, we've got to trust those guys. So the only explanation for women discovering the tomb is that it's real. Number five, the entirety of early church preaching was centered on the historical fact of Jesus' resurrection. If you look through the book of Acts, if you look even through early church fathers, everything is centered on the resurrection. It changed everything. It purchased the gospel. It told us for sure that the gospel is actually true. Jesus did what he said he did. He was who he said he was. If you look through the, the book of Acts, just look through all the sermons, and every time somebody is sharing the gospel, it's always focused and mentioned that Jesus is alive. It's all focused on the resurrection. Number six, Jesus' tomb was not enshrined. If you go to Israel today, you go to Jerusalem, every single place that history tells us where Jesus like taught, where Jesus was even walking to the cross, and he stopped and put his hand on the wall, they believe he did this at a certain spot, Every place where, where Golgotha is, where he was crucified, all these places, there are churches there. They've been enshrined. There's stuff all around these places because it was passed down that this is where this happened. This is where this happened. This is where this happened. They're all enshrined because it, we like to make a big deal about these certain places on the earth. Jesus' tomb was never enshrined because he wasn't there. There wasn't the end of the story. They could have found it easily, and likely they, they did find it, but they didn't enshrine it. They didn't care because, well, that didn't matter. He's out of it. He's out of the grave. He's not there anymore. Number seven, and finally, with the circumstantial, Christianity exploded on the earth and is still exploding to this day. Right now in our world, more, more guys have try to convince people that the resurrection didn't happen, that Christianity is false, there's no way there's a God that created everything. There's no way that happened. And they try to prove this all the time through science and through different things like this. And the more they try to disprove it, the more Christianity, it just keeps growing. It's exploding in Africa right now. It's exploding in South America right now. And it exploded in this first century time. You see in the book of Acts that as soon as the first sermon is preached, 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people come to faith in Christ because it was a fact that Jesus got out of the grave. And when Peter explains to all of these people just why Jesus rose from the dead, just why Jesus died, just why Jesus was living, 
When they understood that and they knew the resurrection was real, 3,000 of them become Christians that day. And it just keeps exploding. It keeps spreading. And it's spread all the way to America. And here we are 2,000 years later and we're still, tons of us are still worshiping Jesus. There is no way to explain Christianity exploding on the earth other than the fact that Jesus' resurrection is real. That it actually happened. So we've seen biblical, we've seen some circumstantial. Third thing I just want to look at briefly, historical evidence of Jesus' resurrection. Now I preface this with a quote. It's a guy named Thomas Arnold. He's a professor of modern history at Oxford. He said this, No one fact in the history of mankind is proven by better and fuller evidence of every sort than this one. Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead. In the first century, there was a guy named Josephus. He was a Jew, and he was employed by the state. He wasn't a Christian, and he was a historian. So his whole job, being paid by the state, was just to record historical facts and to tell the truth. That's his job. He has no agenda. He's not a Christian. He's not trying to lead people astray by saying, these things happen. He was born in 37 A.D., so he was born about three years after Jesus' death and resurrection. So this guy's recording history and eyewitnesses and talking to people, not with any agenda. And he, he says this, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. That's his miracles. A teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, the anointed one of God. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, he's talking about the leaders of the Jewish people in that day, when Pilate, at their suggestion, had Jesus condemned to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again on the third day as the divine prophets had foretold. These and 10,000 under other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians, so named from Jesus, are not extinct to this day. It's not just the Bible. It's not just circumstantial evidence. It's history. You can look back through these early times and see many historians that document the fact that we can't deny this. If we were to try to cover this up, we would be just lying and we wouldn't be historically accurate. The truth is that Jesus died and Jesus appeared three days later alive. I want to put something forth to you. It's actually a far bigger leap of faith to say that the resurrection did not happen when you look at the evidence of it. When you look at the historical facts of it, it's a bigger leap to say it didn't happen than to say that it did. You guys see what I'm saying? When you put all, if you have all this evidence for something happening, to say that, no, no, it didn't happen, what you're having to do is say, uh, we can't even be logical about this. No, 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 no. I just, and what you're really saying is, I don't want that to be true. And most people, people make that leap of faith into saying, I believe it didn't happen. Even though all this evidence says it did, I believe it didn't happen. It's because we don't want to be accountable. It's because Jesus said things like, repent and believe in me. Jesus said things like, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so mankind doesn't want to be accountable to that. They don't want to say that Jesus is who he says he is, did what he said he did. So we make this huge leap of faith and say he didn't resurrect because we just don't want it to be true. I tell you all of this because Jesus is alive. You hear me? Jesus is alive. I tell you all of these things because I want you to understand that Christians, what it means to be a Christian is not just turn your brain off and just say, I believe whatever somebody tells me. <laughs> That's how the world views us for the most part is that we just turn our brain off and you believe someone arose from the dead, get real. You believe Jesus is God, get real. That's ridiculous. But I tell you all these things, Jesus is alive. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father because he is alive. 
Jesus is ruling and reigning and sovereign because he is alive. Jesus commands you to repent, to turn to him for salvation. Because salvation is through him alone. And he commands you to do that because he is alive. Jesus forgives sin and saves people still to this day because he is alive. Jesus is preparing a place for those who trust him because he's alive. Jesus came in humility the first time, but he's coming again in glory and power and to judge the living and the dead because he is alive. Jesus is one day going to usher in a new creation and make all things new because he's alive. Jesus is alive. Furthermore, I tell you this because Jesus isn't glorified by us turning our brains off. Jesus isn't glorified by us just saying, yeah, I believe it. Jesus is glorified as we look at it, even logically, and we look at it and say, look at the evidence. And we say, it's clear. And we trust in him and we look and we hold the Bible as true and we trust in him. Not just because someone told us to, not just because some of our friends do, not because our parents believe this is true. And we said, well, it sounds like a good idea. Jesus is glorified as we look at it and we say, this is it. I see it. I'm not going to become simple in my thinking, but I'm going to dig into this. I'm going to investigate and the conclusion you'll have to come to if you're honest and open-minded is that Jesus got out of the grave. In addition, I tell you this because I want you to know the facts so you can confidently talk to other people about the resurrected Jesus. A lot of people have these little problems that we've talked about and they say, well, Jesus didn't really die or how do we know Jesus arose from the dead? I tell you this because I want you guys to engage people in your lives and to be equipped to do that, to talk to people about Jesus. I want, if someone were to ask you or if it were to come up, why are you a Christian? Because Jesus is alive. He's really great. He lived, he died, he got out of the grave three days later. Can I talk to you about him? I would love to share about Jesus with you. It's good news. I'm not trying to push an agenda on you. I just want you to know Jesus. I want you to be freed from your sin. I want you to be reconciled to your creator. And that happens because Jesus lived, died, and he got out of the grave. He's alive. He's saving people. I want you guys to be able to talk to your friends boldly and confidently. So that's why I tell you all this. I, don't, I think a lot of you guys, I don't have to convince you Jesus arose from the dead, but I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing it because I don't want you to ever have the posture of yeah, I just accept it. But dig through it. Think through it. Second thing. Why we hope in a future resurrection. Now, resurrection means not just life after death. Resurrection doesn't mean, doesn't mean oh, I can't talk. Doesn't mean that everyone avoids punishment in the end. Resurrection rightly means someone dies, their body goes in the grave or wherever it goes. And then eventually, their spirit will return to their body, and their body will be made new and glorified, sin, sickness, all of that gone. And this is what Jesus' resurrection was. It's death and then return to eternal life. Not just someone dies, and then three days later, they come back from the dead, and then, you know, 60 years later, they die again. This is why the accounts in, in the gospel accounts are not resurrection accounts. When Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, who had been dead four days, walks out of the grave and he smelled like crap because he had been dead and he's wrapped in burial cloths. This wasn't a resurrection. That was a revivification. Because Lazarus, Lazarus later died again. Resurrection rightly means we die and then we will come back to life by the power of Jesus, our soul returning to our body, reunited in perfect soul, perfect flesh. We will be given new, glorious bodies. So many, many people think that it's ridiculous that Christians would claim to know what happens after we die, right? You guys ever run into that? Said something on Twitter a few months ago about Jesus' resurrection or about what happens when we die, and I had a guy, you know, at me and say, uh, no one actually knows that, dude. That's all just, you're just saying that. No one actually knows that for a fact. It's all speculation. And that's how a lot of people view it, that it's just speculation. We can't really know what happens 
after we die. Think with me. If you were alive, I'm looking around. I don't think any of us were alive in 1969. But think if you were alive on July 25th, 1969. That's the day after the astronauts got back from the moon when the first man walked on the moon. Think if you were to talk to Neil and you were to say, dude, what was it like? And he could tell you what the moon was like. He has been there. And then someone else comes up and says, hey, you have no idea what the moon is like. You know, uh, yeah, I'm talking to Neil. He's freaking walked on it. He walked on it a few days ago. Now he's back. The reason that we knew then and the reason we know now what the moon is like and that it's not just a figment of our imagination. We don't just see it and say, oh, that's cool. It's just light reflecting a certain... It's people have been there. Neil Armstrong walked on it. Now, a lot of people say that was a conspiracy, and it was staged, and whatever. People just like to say everything was a conspiracy. <laughs> but we know what the moon is like. We know it's not just our imagination. We know what it feels like because Neil and other guys since then have walked on the moon. The reason that Christians claim to know what happens when we die is because we know the one who has died and came back to life. We know the one that claimed he is the resurrection and the life. And he proved it by his own resurrection. It's not like we're cocky about it. It's not like we're arrogant about it, saying we know what happens when we die. We just know Jesus who conquered death. This is why we hope in a future resurrection. When someone dies that we are close to, and maybe this has happened to some of you guys recently or with, within the last few years, someone dies that you're close to, we know that as much as we would maybe like it, there is no hope for us bringing that person back. It's not possible for us to bring someone back to life that's dead. But the truth of what happened to Jesus, is that the scripture says when Jesus died, it said God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. When one of us dies, we go, it's not possible for us to come back. When Jesus died, it says, it's not possible for him to stay dead. The impossible has become possible. If the resurrection is true, as we've looked at, that it just is. If the resurrection is true, then everything that Jesus said has to be true. If Jesus died and didn't get out of the grave, we would rightly dismiss him as a crazy person or as a liar. But the fact that he said he was going to rise, and the fact that he did arise, tells us he's telling us the truth. The craziest thing that he said, by far the craziest thing, is that when I die, I'm going to come back. And that came true. So if you work backwards from there and look at everything else he said, and you go, well, in light of the resurrection, yeah, yeah, he's God. Yeah, he forgives sin. Jesus can do what seems impossible to us, but he does the impossible Tim Keller rightly said, if Jesus rose from the dead, you have to accept all that he said. But if Jesus did not rise from the dead, why bother about any of it? He says, it, it's not, it doesn't really hang on whether or not you like Jesus' teaching or you like what he said or any of that stuff, but it hangs on the fact of if he resurrected, he's Lord. If he resurrected, everything that he said was true. It all hangs on that. Jesus conquered death, so we believe him when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Luke 11, 25, and 26. Yes, Jesus, yes, we believe this. By your grace, we believe this, and we will keep believing this. What it means to be a Christian by trusting in Jesus' performance in your place, is not simply understanding and believing that Jesus lived for righteousness, died for sin, and resurrected for salvation. It's you believing that Jesus lived for your righteousness. Jesus died for your sin. And Jesus resurrected for your salvation. This is the difference. Becoming a Christian is not just affirming some facts, but the gospel is actually good news, and it's not just random facts that you say, yeah, I affirm that's true. 
The gospel is good news personally for each and every one of you. It's good news for me because it, it's not just Jesus lived for righteousness. Jesus lived for my righteousness. Jesus lived perfect, sinless, because I didn't and I couldn't. He did that so his righteousness would be accounted to me. Jesus died for my sin. On the cross, Jesus wasn't just dying for sin, he was dying for mine. Jesus resurrected for my salvation, conquering Satan, conquering sin, conquering death, and proving he lived for righteousness, he died for sin. That's the proof, the resurrection. I will never call you to turn your brain off in any way and just accept it. But we know because of the resurrection, it's personal. It changes everything. A third and most joyfully, what Jesus' resurrection promises those who trust him. This is when we get into the really, really good stuff. And I tell you what it means to be a Christian because my hopes are that some of you maybe call yourself Christian. But you haven't really embraced the gospel. You haven't really turned from sin to trust in the finished work of Jesus in your place. It's all about maybe rules or morals or it's all about the fact that you pray to prayer sometimes. That's not the case. The case is Jesus did this trusting, believing that he did this for you to save you. You. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means to become a Christian, is to detach from hoping in yourself in any way and to attach your hope to Jesus and that it's finished and that he did it all for you. But what Jesus' resurrection promises those who trust him, four quick things. Jesus' resurrection promises a Savior who can never die again. Romans 6, 8 says, For we know that Christ being raised from the dead, will never die again. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about the gospel. Jesus is alive. It's finished. It's secure. It's good news that will never go away. It'll only keep growing inside of you and in the world until one day Jesus comes and makes all things new. It's done. Number two, Jesus' resurrection promises our new birth. 1 Peter 1, 3-5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. New birth essentially means, a lot of us are really brought up in this part of the country and not really taught what new birth means. New birth is not just when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you're born again. New birth actually happens before you are able to even trust in Jesus. But the new birth of the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates your heart and gives you a new heart. What happens is all of us are born into this world and we are just opposed to the way of God. We are opposed to God. We are opposed to Jesus. We want to be our own king and so we are. We live like we're our own king. Some of us do it by being rebellious. Some of us do it by trying to be really morally upright. But we're all opposed. But what the new birth does is God removes our heart of stone that doesn't love him, that hates him, that only loves wickedness and sin and us being king. And he puts in a heart of flesh that loves Jesus, that sees Jesus, that is able to look to Jesus and love him and trust in him. This is the grace that God shows us in the gospel is that if you can even believe on Jesus, it's because that new birth has happened, that you are able to see Jesus as glorious, that you're not opposed to him anymore, you're not an enemy of him anymore, but you see what he did and you trust in it. It causes us to be born again, and it's not something we can cause to happen, it's something by his grace he causes to happen. And then we're able to do what we're commanded to do, to believe on Jesus, to trust in Jesus. His resurrection promises our new birth. Thirdly, Jesus' resurrection promises our justification. Romans 4, 24 and 25 says, Jesus was delivered up for our sins and raised for our justification. The word justification is this legal sense of not just you've committed crimes and you don't have to pay for those crimes. But it's that plus 
you are given this favor and grace of, it's not just you're not guilty anymore, but it's actually you're accounted as righteous. The good news of our justification, because what Jesus did in his life, death, and resurrection, is that God the Father does not look at us and just say, I'm not pissed at you anymore because you sinned against me. God's anger and wrath for sin is removed because Jesus bore that in his body on the cross and purchased that God's favor and his adoption would rest on us and that we would be brought into his family. It's not like we're 10 yards away and God's just like, well, I'm not going to kill you anymore because Jesus died for you. But it's we are brought near. We are justified. We are viewed as if we have lived the life that Jesus lived. Perfectly submissive. And it, this is one of the hardest things to understand and to believe. To simply trust that our justification, that the fact that we are brought near to God, that our sins are gone, that we're righteous, is not by something that we do. All of life is that way. You live up, you do enough, people like you, you're accepted. The gospel says you can never live up. Jesus did for you so that it would count for you. The scripture says Jesus lived for our righteousness. The scripture says that Jesus died for our sin. But how do we know it's actually true? How do we know that's not just something the Bible says to give us comfort? We know because of the resurrection. Jesus' resurrection is God stamping, paid in full, perfectly righteous across all of us so that no one can miss it. The resurrection was such a big moment in the history of the world so that everyone would know it is finished. God stamps paid in full, perfectly righteous across the universe, across history, so that we can't deny it. And number four, and something that we don't dive into hardly at all in the church, and as far as this church, I apologize that we don't dive into this more. Jesus' resurrection promises our resurrection. Church, let me just wash you with this a few scriptures over our future resurrection. Remember, it's not just life after death. It is eternal life after death. It's we die, our spirit goes to be with God the Father in heaven until all things are done on earth, and then he descends and creates, recreates the heavens and the earth, purging the world from sin, from destruction, and God actually comes and lives with us. Heaven is not our ultimate destination, but the new earth is. That's what the scripture tells us. It's not just some metaphysical place that we're going to go to and play harps and float on clouds forever. But our souls will be reunited with perfect bodies. Our bodies will be glorified. Sin will not affect them anymore. So there will be no sickness. There will be no death. There will be no sorrow. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 says, For as... By a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And 2 Corinthians 4.14 says, We know that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us into his presence. And Philippians 3.20 and 21 says, Jesus will change our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him to even him even to subject all things to himself. In 1 Corinthians 15:51 through 53 says, "Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable." And we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. Jesus' resurrection from death to eternal life promises that he will resurrect those who trust him. In the same way that he was resurrected. We will be given new bodies. Glorified bodies. Because Jesus is alive, we will never get sick. No cancer. No HIV. No AIDS. Not even a common cold. We will never get depressed. 
because Jesus is alive, we will never again wallow in guilt. He resurrects us, we will never again feel fear. We will never again shrink back like a coward. We will never again mistreat anyone. We will never again sin. The weight of that alone, temptation to sin, temptation to live in rebellion to God, temptation to live how we're not created to live, that will be gone. Think of the things that you struggle with. Many of us struggle with different things. A lot of us the same things deep down on a daily basis. We are tempted. We give in. We know sin destroys and it brings destruction to our relationships. We won't, we won't sin. It won't be an option. It will be gone. It will be wiped away. Peter was made to walk on water in his old body. And imagine what Jesus will enable you to do in your new one. Because Jesus is alive, when he resurrects us, we will see things more glorious than we have ever seen. We will smell things more intriguing than we have ever smelled. We will feel things more satisfying than we have ever felt. We will hear things more beautiful than we have ever heard. We will see Jesus fully. Right now we, we hope in Jesus and we read about Jesus in the scripture and we sing to Jesus and we, we pray to Jesus and we have this fellowship with him. But right now we are looking at him through a veil. We can dimly see him. But when he resurrects those who trust him by what he's done in our place, we will see Jesus. You will see him face to face and you're going to bawl your eyes out and he's going to wipe your tears from your eyes. We will be eternally joyful forever with him. This is the good news of the gospel. This is what Jesus' resurrection promises those who trust him. A savior that will never die. Our new birth. Our justification. And our future resurrection. This is the good news of the gospel. It's done. It's finished. There we will see his face and never ever sin. <coughs> There from the rivers of his grace drink endless pleasures in. Because Jesus is alive. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. Thank you for raising Jesus from the dead. I thank you for stamping this paid in full, this truth of we are righteous, we will be resurrected. It is true, it is finished. We thank you for stamping that across the history of the world in Jesus' resurrection so that we can know and we can know that we have hope. We can know that we have a purpose to glorify you through preaching this good news to everyone, through sharing this gospel to everyone. We thank you that Jesus got out of the grave. We thank you that we have a Savior that will never die, that we know that our new birth will happen, and many of us it's already happened. We thank you for that. We thank you that we can know because of Jesus' resurrection that we, in your sight, we are justified. We are sinless and perfectly righteous because Jesus paid for it and Jesus lived for it. Thank you that we know that. Jesus, thank you for living, dying, arising. We, we could talk about it forever. I could pray about it forever. I'll just say thank you so much. And I ask that you would give people in this room, if those have not come to Jesus, those who have not become a Christian would repent of their morals, would repent of their self-righteousness, would repent of their rebellion, and they would just turn to Jesus and trust in the finished work of Jesus for them in their place. God, cause salvation to happen this morning. Anoint them with joy because Jesus is alive. Jesus, we believe that you'll save people, and so we just ask you, just do it. And those of us that are already in, in you, Jesus, have come to faith in you. Cause this crazy amount of joy in your spirit to pour out on us. And now as we worship, as we sing, as we take the Lord's Supper, and as we go out into our lives, living lives in light of what you've done, empower us to do that. Give us joy in it. And I thank you for giving me the breath and the ideas and the thoughts and the words to even stand up here and to feed your church, Ecclesia, this morning. All for your glory. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.